to advance the public interest. A few, a few reflections on the outcome of the session. First, I appreciate that lawmakers chose to continue our investments in K-12 public schools and early childhood education. For a generation, we underfunded our schools. That changed last year with the passage of the Student Success Act. School this fall, however, won't look like a normal school year. The public health crisis will require many schools to implement comprehensive distance learning. In this environment, it's even more important than ever that we invest in our kids and their schools and that we fund our future. I do have some concerns about the overall use of reserves and one-time funds in the legislatively approved budget. We have spent a number of years building up a rainy day fund and state reserves in order to weather this kind of economic downturn. But that savings account is only so big. If we use a substantial portion of it now, the budget decisions next year become even harder. And we already know that there are more challenging decisions ahead of us. I'm also disappointed, frankly, that lawmakers didn't follow through on the plan to close two prisons. I think, and the evidence shows, that we can be much smarter in our approach to tackling crime. For the first time in many years, Oregon prison projections are down. We can safely close prisons, keep our communities safe, and reduce taxpayer expenses. We should be focusing on preventing crime, investing in drug and alcohol treatment, and other strategies to help people get that are caught up in the criminal justice system and to help society as a whole. Second, I know lawmakers, in particular Senator James Manning and Representative Janelle Bynum, worked diligently for weeks to develop and take public input on House Bill 4301. This legislation will tightly limit the use of force by police officers, a much needed step toward police reform. This comes on the heels of five police reform bills passed in the previous special session, and I hope additional action will come in the weeks and months ahead. Third, lawmakers passed two bills to help unemployed Oregonians. Senate Bill 1703, which my team put together with agency leaders, allows the right hand in state government to talk to the left hand. Now, the Revenue Department and the Employment Department will be able to share data so that benefit claims can be processed much more quickly. And Senate Bill 701, proposed by Labor Commissioner Val Hoyle, will make sure Oregonians aren't phased out of unemployment benefits just because they have a small amount of the income from a part-time job. Unfortunately, a few lawmakers prevented passage of a bill, a third unemployment bill, one that my administration proposed. This bill, Senate Bill 1702, would have made it quicker to process unemployment benefit applications from employees of both public and private education institutions during the pandemic. This would have gotten more money into people's hands more quickly and freed up agency employees to move on to processing other claims. To see this bill, which had broad bipartisan support, voted down by three legislators was very frustrating. The team at the Employment Department is working day and night to pay out tens of thousands of unemployment claims during the worst economic uh, downturn in generations. To slow this process down in any way, large or small, is absolutely outrageous. Thank you, and now I have time for questions. Thanks everyone for calling in. This is Charles Boyle in the governor's office. Uh, we only have about half an hour today, so we'll try to get through as many, as many questions as we can. Um, and we'll go first to Lindsay Nadrick with point six. Go ahead, Lindsay. 
Hey, yeah, I hope you can hear me. My um, question does have to do with unemployment benefits. I mean, where do we go from here now that that bill was voted down? What was the real opposition to that? I continue to hear from people every day who have now gone five months without income, and they feel like your office and others aren't making this a priority, and they, and they want real answers. Look, Lindsay, my office has been working every single day. I get up every single morning figuring out how we can get more money uh, into the pockets of Oregonians. This was one small tool that would have ensured that claims in the adjudication process would have been processed more quickly. You'll have to ask lawmakers uh, why they voted it down. It's really easy to play the blame game in this business, uh, but we need helpful solutions, and this was one uh, that lawmakers rejected. Extremely unfortunate. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, we'll go next to Kendra Kent with KPTV. Go ahead, Kendra. Hello there. I would like Governor Brown to comment on whether sending the OSP troopers in to help Portland police and monitor the federal courthouse has been effective. Um, you know, they were scheduled to be wrapping up their duty soon within that two week window. And so my question is, is, is was it effective and where are you going to go from here with that? Well, I want to say thank you to our Oregon State Troopers that are assisting uh, with efforts in Portland to ensure that pro protesters can participate in peaceful protests and exercise their right to free speech. Um, these folks are from all over Oregon, and uh, they uh, came from communities large and small to assist in our efforts. I think there's absolutely no question um, that by having Oregonians there, uh, it has made uh, a substantial difference in what is happening in downtown Portland. And of course, getting Trump's troops off of the streets of downtown Portland has uh, substantially calmed things down. What I think is most important as Oregonians that we turn um, to the critically important work of tackling racial justice in our law enforcement system, in our uh, criminal justice system, in our education system, in our healthcare system. This is work that we all need to go to do together. We need to be collaborative, collaborative. we need to work collectively, and we need to co-create um, an Oregon um, that benefits all of our citizens. Thanks, Kendra. Um, next up, we'll go to Claire Whitacombe with the Statesman Journal. Go ahead, Claire. Good morning, Governor Brown. Um, I had a question about the, the state prisons. Um, could you tell me which two prisons did you want to close, and what's your understanding of why uh, lawmakers decided not to do that at this time? So, um uh, we were working with the Department of Corrections to identify two facilities um, that are, um, shall we say, in uh, more challenging uh, uh, conditions and uh, that would enable us to uh, shut down over time. We think it's really important um, that these resources, given that we are seeing the need for fewer beds, that these resources go elsewhere. Um, a prison bed costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $39,000 to $50,000 a year, and those investments um, certainly could get a better return uh, if they were invested in, for example, early childhood education. In terms of why, that's a really good question for legislators, um, but I will continue to work with the department and look at the options available to us over the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Claire. Uh, next up, we have Les Zeitz with the Malheur Enterprise. Go ahead, Les. Uh, good morning, Governor. You, you expressed some concern about dipping into the reserves uh, to help balance the budget. And frankly, when you look at the budget cuts that were approved last night, uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a change in the services that Oregonians will get. Are, are you considering any executive action to reverse some of that uh, use of reserve funds? So there are a couple of options um, on the table right now, but there are two um, uh, concerns that I have. Number one, uh, the use of uh, PERS reserve funds. I don't agree with draining uh, these one-time resources. 
and obviously they used a portion of the rainy day funds that we have been working um, for years to set aside. Um, my concern is that this will make more challenging decisions um, even harder in the future. Um, in terms of my actions, I'm, I'm honestly leaving all options on the table. Um, I liken this to uh, a law school exam where you have uh, no right answer and you have to choose the least worst answer. I am hoping uh, that our uh, Congress, our uh, federal government will take action uh, to provide an additional tranche of funding to the states and local jurisdictions. I am talking uh, with our, our congressional delegation about that. I certainly was on a call to the White House on Monday this week. Um, I think governors uh, from red states, blue states, are all encouraging uh, Republicans and Democrats to come together in Washington, D.C. and make sure that there are resources available for the states and uh, local jurisdictions. Obviously, um, if that doesn't happen in the next couple of weeks, I will need to take appropriate action. Well, if I may follow up, Governor, are, are you, is it one of your options on the table to strike out the uh, dipping into the, like the PERS Reserve Fund by executive action? Um, Les, I, I honestly have all, uh, all of my options are on the table. Um, it is very dependent upon what uh, type of action, if any, that Congress takes. I think it's critically important that they act now. Otherwise, states like Oregon and other states across the country are going to have to take even, even greater uh, budget uh, action uh, in the next several weeks. Thanks, Les. Uh, next up, we've got Dirk Vanderhart from OPB. Go ahead, Dirk. Yeah, thanks, Governor. Um, I want to follow up on the prisons thing. Uh, two questions, actually, very quickly. But the prisons thing, you know, it seems like a foregone conclusion amongst lawmakers that the prisons are yours to close if you want to make that decision, and many of them expect you to do so. So it seems like they're clearly getting that message. Have you made that call already? And secondly, I just wondered, um, it sounded like on the education unemployment bill that failed, there was will or at least some thought of making a deal even after it failed, but that the release that you put out solely blaming Republicans ginned up some really bad feeling in that chamber and it sort of put the kibosh on that. Do you regret how you approached that, uh, that situation? Absolutely not. Like I said, it's really easy to play the blame game. Uh, when I talk to lawmakers and ask them if they had another solution, they absolutely did not. Uh, in terms of prisons, uh, I said, I'm really clear. We're exploring all options available to, the, uh, to me in terms of my executive authority, and I expect to be taking action over the next several weeks. Thanks, Derek. Uh, next up, we've got Blake Allen from KTBZ. Go ahead, Blake. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, is there any word yet on an office mask mandate at this time? Uh, my Deputy Chief of Staff, uh, Gina Zedlick, is working on that. Uh, I anticipate that you'll see something in the next week or so. All right. Uh, can you provide any details, any preliminary details on that, what it might look like, any exemptions? Not at this time. As you can imagine, given the different types of office environments, it's extremely challenging. Um, my team is working very closely with the Oregon Health Authority and uh, other uh, medical experts um, to make sure that we do this in both what I would consider a common sense way, uh, but also ensure that um, staff and employees uh, working in office buildings are protected. Thanks, Bob. All right, thank you, Governor. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got Peter Wong from the Portland Tribune. Go ahead, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, Peter, we can hear you. Hey, uh, what is the status of a uh, potential liability shield that I know you've had a group work on and would it involve having the legislature return to do anything about it, or do you plan to do that by executive action? Uh, in uh, answer to your last question, uh, Peter, I would expect uh, that it would require legislative action. Um, so um, I know that lawmakers are working uh, to address these issues, both uh, in terms of the liability issues and ensuring that uh, folks who are injured on the job uh, or uh, not injured on the job, that get COVID on the job, 
uh, have access to a, appropriate compensation. So uh, I know there's a work group happening and look forward to seeing uh, the result of that work group over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, next up, we've got Hillary Baroud with the Oregonian. Go ahead, Hillary. Hi, uh, Governor. Thanks for taking our question. So does that mean, just quickly to follow up, that you expect um, to call a third special session? And if so, I'm curious um, what your priority would be. Thanks, Hillary. Appreciate the question. Um, I, I think that does sort of um, would require a third special session. I think it's dependent upon a couple of things. Number one, whether or not uh, Congress is able to get their act together and come up with a funding package for uh, states and local jurisdictions uh, and get that passed through both houses. Obviously, um, if they do not, that's going to require either the legislature or myself taking uh, other uh, drastic uh, budget, budget measures. Um, secondly, I know that the um, People of Color Caucus is continuing to work on law enforcement reforms. I am um, continuing to support them in this effort and look forward to seeing additional legislation. If they can get to an agreement, um, I would certainly propose sooner uh, rather than later. We have other issues out there and um, of course, uh, we just talked about uh, workers' comp and uh, liability protections for school districts and businesses. So um, I think those would be the priorities. We haven't had any detailed conversations. Obviously, lawmakers worked long and hard on Monday, and uh, they need a day of rest to recover before we start the next conversation. Thanks, and quick follow-up on the policing bills. Some law enforcement leaders have described the chokehold choke and other use of force bill as codifying what they were already doing. Now, that wasn't every agency in the state, but do you see it as more than just codifying um, existing local policies? That's a really good question. I, I would say that, yes, it certainly codifies the current practice in some jurisdictions around the state. This gives us a statewide policy and a clear, consistent message about the use of this particular measures uh, in the law enforcement community. Um, so I think it's critically important uh, that we uh, tighten restrictions around the use of child faults. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks. Uh, next up, we've got Gary Warner from EO Media. Go ahead, Gary. Yes, good morning, Governor. Um, the uh, Big Ten Conference this morning voted to uh, cancel football for the fall. Uh, the Pac-12 is meeting today and is expected to do the same. Uh, have you had any discussions with uh, folks uh, ahead of this? Um, and what's your reaction to uh, this action? Uh, I, I certainly had uh, conversations, uh, and my team has as well. Uh, my reaction is I'm really sad. This is really, really hard. Um, I think many of us as Oregonians love going to Hudson Stadium or Research Stadium to watch the Beavers or the Ducks play. Um, I certainly am uh, always playing the betting game with Governor Inslee about his Huskies that always uh, get beaten by our Ducks and our Beavers. Um, so I certainly was looking forward to having that happen again this fall. Does uh, this decision on football uh, trickle down in any way or uh, reflect any way um, what might happen to the larger universities, uh, you know, OSU and U of O uh, during the fall? Uh, uh, you know, I, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think we're going to see in a few hours, but I, I, I think the, the, the handwriting is clearly on the wall. Um, what I would say is this to the college athletes who have worked so hard um, whether they're from smaller schools or larger schools, terribly, terribly sorry. Um, I know many of you um, have worked hard, uh, not just this summer, but um, for the last number of years to play at this level. And I appreciate your patience and your um, willingness to persist. Uh, I, I think not only for college athletes, but for high school athletes, for our Olympic athletes, this is a really challenging year, and my heart goes out to all of them. I'm, I'm sorry. I think I, I was a little unclear. What I meant was, does the action on sports reflect 
what's going to happen to the to the campuses at large. Oh, Is this, I'm you know, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Th- no, that's okay. Um, no, I'm sorry. So uh, the, the universities are working very hard with their local public health. Universities, both public and private, small and large, are working very closely uh, with their uh, public health. Uh, we obviously put out some guidelines in working with the Higher Education Coordinating Council, um, but um, I think our goal here is to make sure that students are safe, that professors and staff on our college campuses uh, are safe, and that these students get access to a high quality education. And this school year is not going to look like your normal school year, even at the university and community college level. So I know it's going to be a really challenging year for our community college students, our university students. My heart aches for you. Um, my my times on a college campus were really important, and um, I know it's just going to be a challenging year for our students. We have to make sure you're safe. We have to make sure your professors are safe, and obviously the staff that helps uh, run the universities and community colleges. Thanks, Gary. Thank you very much, Governor. Thanks, Gary. And we have just a few more minutes, so we're just going to try to get to a few of the elements we haven't gotten to yet. So uh, next up is Alyssa with Central Oregon Daily News. Go ahead, Alyssa. Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Thanks so much. I was just wondering if we can expect to hear anything on those new rural school metrics today. The short answer is yes. Uh, my understanding is that the department is going to be uh, releasing that information this afternoon. I want to say thank you. Um, I know that a number of um, su- superintendents, uh, educators, and school board members from remote and rural Oregon school districts have assisted uh, in this uh, uh, revision of our guidelines. Um, I I think we all share the same goal. We all want to get our students back in school as quickly as possible, Um, but particularly our earliest grades, um, early childhood education, K through three, um, extremely challenging to do over the internet. So um, what's so key though, is that we all work to make sure that our children and our teachers and our staff are safe and that our kids, regardless of who they are or where they live, have access to a high quality education. I'm absolutely committed to making sure that our students from historically underserved communities, our communities of color, our low income communities, our rural, com- uh, our rural communities, get access to the tools and the services they need to thrive. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, next up, we have Katie Strait with KOBI. Go ahead, Katie. Hello, Governor. Uh, It seems coronavirus isn't going anywhere. It likely will go on into 2021. Uh, What are your long-term plans if coronavirus is still a major issue within our state? Um, That's a really depressing question. Um, I've been really, really clear. Um, We, as Oregonians, have made tremendous sacrifices to um, slow the transmission and reduce the spread of the virus. We have, as a result of the sacrifices Oregonians have made, have one of the lowest infection rates in the country, and that continues to this day. Um, I I think my goal is to figure out how we learn to live with the virus and protect our most vulnerable communities. Um, And that means making sure you uh, continue to follow your three W's. Uh, Watch your physical distance, um, wear your face coverings, and wash, wash, wash your hands. In addition, um, we need to obviously expand our efforts around messaging and education. We see some of the highest infection rates in young people under the ages of 40. We believe that's a result of social gatherings. That's why I've imposed some very restrictive actions in terms of um, informal social gatherings in houses, 10 and under. Um, and restricted uh, venue gatherings to 100 and other, under. We need to keep these efforts up to keep uh, the virus rates down and to protect our elderly citizens, our folks living in nursing homes, and our communities of color who have borne the brunt of this disease. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Uh, last question, uh, we've got Kevin Winter with the uh, Lake County Examiner. Go ahead, Kevin. 
Uh, Governor, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Excellent, thank you. Um, my question is like looking forward to the next biennium when you release your budget next year. What are some of your goals for next year related to like education and other priority areas? So um, I am convening my racial justice council uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. And um, the role and the goal of the council is to assist me um, for two things. Number one, in development of my budget. Um, obviously, it's going to be a challenging budget uh, cycle. We know that our uh, revenues down, are down by over $4 billion. That's a significant, um, some would say catastrophic uh, impact to our state budget. Um, I think it's really important um, that as we look uh, ahead, that we center the voices of African American, brown, and indigenous Oregonians at the forefront of our work. And that's what the council will help me do. Um, I hope they will assist me in making key decisions as I develop my budget and submit it to the printer at the end of November. In addition, um, I'm hoping that there will be room for key investments to assist um, and support and invest in these uh, historically underserved communities. The second piece is uh, to assist with the development of a legislative agenda. Um, our legislative agenda and obviously the budget were in process when the pandemic happened. Uh, my work, frankly, mm -hmm. on a legislative agenda has been put on ice. I hope uh, that the Racial Justice Council can assist me in developing a legislative agenda that really um, works to tackle racism in this state, uh, in our criminal justice system, in our health care system and in our education system and in our economic system and work to eradicate, adopt policies and work to eradicate racism in these policies. So I'm very much looking forward to this work. I think that it's work that we can all do together. And I think that by working together, we can all build a better Oregon for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, that's all, we all the time we have for questions today, everyone. Thanks for calling in. to advance the public interest.